Just a reminder that our documentary, Go Tell the Spartans, is out now, where we go on site to Thmopoli to uncover what really happened at the battle. It will be linked below. Hi guys, welcome to today's video. We're doing something a little bit different. I was browsing YouTube and a Metatron video came up, and of course I clicked on it because I'm a massive fan of the Metatron's channel, and it's another one of his series where he's um, watching Lex Friedman's um, podcast, where he's interviewing Dr. Aldrete, I'm sorry if I pronounced his name wrong, uh, and specifically the section I want to focus on is where he starts talking about the linothorax, or the Tuban yoke, which we'll sort of talk about here. So for those of you that don't know me, my name's Adam, I'm an ancient Greek reenactor and history enthusiast, um, and I sort of wanted to add another sort of opinion onto this, because there's a few things that you said that I very much disagree with. Uh, this isn't an attack on Metatron at all, or uh, Lex Friedman, or Dr. Aldrete as well, it's just I want to add sort of another opinion here, which I think he's sort of significantly, in elements he sort of significantly got wrong. First, I'd like to touch up on what is a linothorax. The word linothorax is a modern name, okay? It does not survive. We don't know what it was called in the ancient period. It is a modern sort of construction name, which the name would sort of imply it was a linen construction. We know from um, literary sources of both linen and leather, with actually leather occasionally being called a spolas uh, as well. So we do have um, very much two... Uh, constructions. We have three main construction theories in the linen realm, that being uh, well, kind of four. Uh, layered linen, so glued layered linen, which is what Dr. Aldrede tested, uh, which more and more in the academic and renamed community is being disregarded as likely not a construction method. Um, then there is un, uh, unglued laid linen, which is getting more and more uh, prevalent in what in the sort of reenactment academic community. Um, there is quilted linen, and there is weaved linen as well. Now, archaeologically, uh, we do have a few sort of parts of surviving ones. One of them is Philip of Macedon's, which is actually entirely metallic. Uh, another one has been partly recreated, but it was leather uh, adorned in scales. So the name Linothorax is a little bit misleading, and you may have noticed that I call it a tube and yoke. Well, there's a reason for that. This style of armour is made up of a tube, and the yokes being the shoulders. And again, we don't really know how this armour was made, we know that there's multiple different construction methods, so this was basically a blueprint that you could put other materials to, likely predominantly organic, although again we have one uh, surviving metal one, um, which was likely coated in a fabric. Uh, you can basically use this blueprint to create multiple different types of armour. Linothorax implies that it's linen, but again we know that there was linen and leather, and there's even possibly other construction methods as well. I myself have worn both of these styles of armour. Uh, I know many who have made their own tube and yokes. Mine, my, mine was made by Ashley Holt, who has sadly very recently um, passed away uh, in a glued linen construction. Uh, we have others that have made them from leather, others that have made them from uh, quilted, uh, quilted linen, some have made them from um, layered linen. For instance, John, who is a member of our group, has just recently finished his, I believe it's 20 layers, I'm not entirely, I can't quite remember, uh, 20 layers unglued linen. And I'd also like to just say that we have practically tested a bronze grass. I'll leave the link to the video in the description. All right, well, it went in. About uh, just enough to poke out the, the metal a little bit, so it did catch. And multiple different tube and yoke construction methods, from glued linen to uh, leather and linen to uh, layered linen. Now look at that! Wow, that's a lot less penetration. So, without the leather core, but more layers of linen. <laughs> Did not penetrate at all. So the non-hardened linen, the soft linen, strain out more layers than before, seems to be the, the best way to go. The only one which actually managed to completely stop a spear blow was the layered linen, interestingly enough, unglued. Um, however, you'd get a lot of internal damage because, of course, it has a lot of give, so you'd get internally bruised, but you wouldn't actually be cut. There's a few things that he talks about here, predominantly when he starts to compare the tube and yoke to the muscle crest, that really um, I want to just talk about. Can it withstand arrows or direct strikes from like swords and that? Absolutely, um, Lex. And I like that you ask this question. I want to see how the professor answers. But the thing is this, imagine it this way. 
take one of those phone books, right? If you take a single page, you can go through it with anything, really, probably with this straw. But if you try and take this straw, in fact, even an, a kitchen knife, when the phone book is closed and you try and go through it, then you'll notice that when you layer many weak things together, eventually, once you pass a sort of, we could call it a critical mass number of layers, then yes, we'll start to provide, will become very difficult to penetrate. So I think that, you know, ancient people were very proficient, they knew what they were doing, but particularly when, you know, the life of your soldiers and warriors is dependent on this. So if an academic like Professor Aldrete in a situation where this is just done for a fun and interesting experiment from an anthropological and archaeological standpoint, is putting so much test into something that they're not wearing, apart from his student, they're not going to wear for combat or that it's not supposed to actually save their lives, imagine how much more the ancient Greeks would have been very thorough in actually finding the correct number of layers that is not too much so that I'd just like to say I think this analogy of paper in a phone book is absolutely great it shows you the effects of layering weak materials can make it incredibly strong and again this is very correct um, they would have got down to probably quite a defined sort of realm of uh, different constructions and again I'd just like to emphasize they're likely in fact we know that there wasn't just one way to create this style of armor. It was basically more of a blueprint that you could create multiple different styles of armor with. Bottom line is a one centimeter thick line of thorax. So a uh, laminated or even sewn, it doesn't have to be laminated, uh, layer of, of linen is about as good protection as two millimeters of bronze. This is the first thing that he says, which frankly is just outrageously wrong. And I don't like to say it like that, but it just is. So I don't think he's ever tested a bronze cuirass. He says two millimeters. Um, most cuirasses archeologically were not two millimeters, around the one to 1.5 millimeter range. My own cuirass is about one to 1.5 millimeters, depending on where it is, front and back. Um, and the section that we tested was made by my friend Andrew, the organizer of our group, um, who made his own bronze cuirass. Uh, and it was sort of a section of that same design. We hit this with so many attacks full powered spear stabs in some instances and they either didn't go through or they went through less than a millimeter which wouldn't have even really been enough to reach you on the other side that's just to demonstrate how incredibly strong the bronze style of armor was something else that's very important to mention which i think i'll sort of touch up on more later um most of the time you would not be getting full powered spear th spear thrusts into you would not happen so this thing was protecting you and even stopping, in some instances, full-powered spear blows, which likely you weren't really facing to begin with. Compare that to the linothorax tests that we've done, about a uh, quarter-inch to half-inch thick leather with layered linen on top. Spear goes through incredibly easily. Glued linen, spear were also went through decently easily. Interestingly enough, the uh, design that actually stopped the spear going through was I believe it was 18 layers of uh, layered unglued linen. So I would disagree with him there. From all the tests that we have done, again, of multiple different tube and yoke construction uh, methods to uh, sections of bronze cuirasses, the bronze cuirass held up significantly better. Which was the thickest comparable body armor of bronze at the time. And we're talking 4th century, 5th century BC here. Um, so classical and Hellenistic Greece. And that would have protected you from, let's say, random arrow strikes on the battlefield. So uh, you could have gotten hit by arrows and they simply wouldn't have gone through. So this is something I, I think he, that's important that he mentions here is, of course, armor isn't just there to defend you from full frontal attacks. It's there to protect you from all sorts of battlefield. There's splintering arrowheads, there's spear shafts breaking, there's sling stones bouncing off of shields, there's rocks being thrown at you. So it's not just there to protect you against bladed weapons, it's there to protect you from all sorts of stuff. And even if an armor doesn't stop a bladed weapon from getting to you, you're way better off having it than not. As again, it's not just there to protect you from a bladed weapon or, or a spear stab. It's there to protect you from everything else in the battlefield, which there's a, a lot going on in the battlefield. So of course, you're better being stabbed with armor than not, even if it goes through, uh, which again, the, the, the tube and yoke here seems to be the most standard 
um, or most commonly depicted armor that we see in ancient Greek statue and, uh, well, just art in general, which would indicate that it was the armor available to the most common soldier. When we talk about hoplites, of course, they're, they're a citizen militia force, so they would have to afford all their own equipment. And interestingly enough, we see far less with the bronze cuirass, likely because it was far more expensive. Most of the depictions we see of bronze cuirass show entirely kitted out soldiers, so uh, helmet, uh, cuirass, greaves, and so on. Many of the depictions that we see of a Tuban yoke do not show full armor. So it's highly likely and highly reasonable to assume that it was the higher up aristocrats who could afford an, ent an entire panoply that were going for the bronze armor, which indicates, again, apart from our practical tests, that it was a better armor than, well, better, it's sort of hard to say, the favored armor by those who could afford it. What are the benefits? Uh, so is there a major weight difference? Yes. So the benefits of this are it's much lighter than metal. He's absolutely correct there. It's actually not. The bronze cuirass mine is 13 pounds. My layered glued linen construction tube and yoke uh, is 10. Three pound difference. Um, others uh, range even heavier, around 15 pounds of a tube and yoke. That's, that's uh, leather uh, with scales on top. It seems to be the heaviest. He says later on in this clip that the bronze cuirass was 24 to 26 pounds, which is double the weight of, a, of an authentic bronze cuirass of around 1 to 1.5 millimeters. So he is dead wrong there. Okay, um, they're relatively the same weight. So a, a bronze cuirass very ergonomically sits on your waist uh, and your, sh your shoulders. It's very comfortable to wear. Uh, if it's fitted to you correctly, which this style of armor would have to be, uh, which is again one reason to indicate that the tube and yoke was far more um, flexible in the way, not mobility wise, but that you could very easily change the fitting. So you could pass a tube and yoke on through generation far easier than you could a bronze cuirass. However, we do see um, sort of fitting adjustments uh, added quite crudely sometimes uh, to these bronze cuirasses. But I'll let the, the clip play out here. Metal armor. So the line of thorax is about 11 pounds. So that's, that's about in line with mine. Again, m mine was 10, so this is actually slightly heavier. But again, we see some far heavier than that as well, about 5 pounds heavier than that. Um, a bronze cuirass of comparable um, protection would have been about 24 to 6 pounds. And this is where I think academia struggles. Obviously, he can be very well versed in the sources. He can tell you all sorts of stuff about when armor was used, how it was made. He can't tell you what it's like to wear it. And this is where I think as a, as a living history enthusiast and as a reenactor, I can sort of give you um, my own sort of take on this. I have worn both of these armors for hours at a time. I've marched in Greece in uh, August uh, at the Battle of Philoplatea in both of these armors. So very hot. We're talking mid 40 degrees Celsius. I can tell you that I would personally choose a bronze cuirass over a tube and yoke. In fact, we only had one guy suffering from heat stroke at this year's Greece event, and he was in a tube and yoke armor. Think of it this way. How does a coat work? A coat uses multiple different layers of material along with air to insulate you. What is a linothorax? Multiple layers of material, which will insulate you and heat up. A bronze cuirass is actually sort of a temperature regulator. So it itself is quite hot because it absorbs the sun, but it also absorbs the heat from you. I'm quite cool, actually, when I'm under my cuirass. It also acts in reverse, and since if you're wearing it when it's cold, it will suck the heat out of you. However, in Greece, you're not usually having to worry about that. The tube and yoke, once it heats up, it will keep that heat like a winter coat stuck to you. Okay, it is very uncomfortable to wear when it gets incredibly hot. Um, it gets more flexible, when it gets hot, but it actually keeps the heat in and makes you overheat quicker than when you're in a 24 pound um, muscle cuirass, which again, muscle cuirasses are not that heavy. They're about half that weight. And this is where I think that sort of practical um, experience, you know, there's that saying, you can never really know a man till you walk a mile in his shoes. And that's very true for the shoes that he wears, the food that he ate and the, and the, the armor and the clothes that he wears as well. So this um, is where I start to, to disagree with the doctor here in a sense that he's he's saying, of course, that the muscle cuirass is far more cumbersome, it's far more heavy, it's far more hot than the, than the thorax, which which isn't true, okay? 
Okay, I want to speak about that very briefly. 24 to 26 kilograms for a breastplate backplate combination of bronze sounds a little excessive unless he was meaning the entire panoply. So thank you, Sean, for pointing that out. My, to put that into perspective, my entire panoply, so helmet, cuirass, and greaves, is 24 pounds. So he is saying, unless he misspoke, but I don't see why because he's comparing Glunothorax to Muscle Crass. Um, he is saying that the Bronze Crass was the weight of the entire panel, which is, is just is not true. Uh, to be honest, in my experience, I want to say that the weight of a bronze thorax, so front and back, breastplate and backplate, was around 6 kilograms. But reg I think that is 13 pounds, excuse my math is correct, around 13, 14 pounds. So yes, that is um, far more in the historical range. Regardless of that, since I can't really ask him to clarify the statement, I'll just assume that he, would, he meant the entire panoply. But regardless of that, his point is still valid, because a, an average linothorax, in my experience, would be expected to weigh between 3 to 3.6 kilograms. So we're pretty much talking about half the weight of a comparable bronze type of cuirass. Okay. Again, I disagree here, and I, and I disagree from multiple different construction methods of the linothorax. Um, and of course, something else that's important to remember is lots of these tube and yokes would have been adorned in scale, sometimes completely. So if you have a 0.5 millimeter thick scale over a one millimeter thick leather or linen backing, then you are adding half the weight of a bronze cuirass onto, roughly speaking, um, a, a tube and yoke. So through my experience, they typically are roughly the same weight. In fact, the heaviest armors that I've held are of the tube and yoke construction. The heaviest one I've held is leather with, with bronze scales. Of course, he is talking about a 2mm thick bronze. That is kind of an example that touches the thickest sphere end, yes, typically if you will. Um, you can so find bronze less. that was a little thinner than that and still provided excellent protection, of course. But yeah, in general, absolutely, as one would think, a linothorax would be much lighter than a bronze counterpart. In I think that's the issue, as one would think, and the doctor here is talking, and, and again, I can't prove this, but I'm assuming he hasn't worn or tested a bronze cuirass, so he is talking as one would think. Um, I also thought that until I got my bronze cuirass. I know others in our group have also thought that until they've worn a bronze cuirass. So that is a misconception, um, and, it, and it, isn't, it isn't correct. And again, it's very difficult for us to say, necessarily, because we, we don't know how the tube and yoke was constructed, or how some of them were constructed. Uh, we have a pretty solid idea, um, but they varied a lot. They probably varied more so than the, than the bronze cuirasses in, in weight, uh, which is represented in the reenactment world. And people say, well, reenactment has errors. Of course it does, so does academia. But what we're doing with reenactment is trying to, or as authentically as we can, recreate from the past, using the sources that we can, these pieces of armor. And out of all of the various methods that are commonly believed to have been the case for these tube and yokes, they aren't as protective as the bronze cuirass. Some of them are lighter, given I'm not saying that the tube and yoke is heavier than the bronze cuirass. I'm not trying to swing the pendulum the other way. Some of them are heavier than the bronze cuirass. Some of them are lighter. Some of them likely offer the same protection, the ones being coated in scale, which are typically the ones that are heavier. Some of them don't, which are the ones that are lighter. In the realm of armor. Um, it's cooler. I mean, you know, yeah. the Mediterranean's a hot place with the hot sun. Again, not true. So I don't think he's worn either a muscle crest or a linothorax in the Mediterranean. Again, I'd just like to say 44 degrees we have worn this armor in Plataea for a week straight in Greece this summer. The bronze crest is a temperature regulator. The, the tube and yoke is an insulator. It will make you hotter. It, it just will. Um, and again, that's something that you think of. Uh, oh, well... Linen's a cool material, that's why we wear linen shirts. Try wearing 20 linen shirts and tell me that that's not hot. That's what you're wearing when you're wearing a linen thorax. Even today, you know, a linen shirt is something you wear when you want to be cool. So it's... It okay, it's interesting that we talked about that. Again, you have to wear 20 linen shirts and tell me that that's cool. That's what you're talking about when you're talking about linen thorax, is 20 shirts. It's much lighter, that gives your troops greater endurance on the battlefield, they can run farther, fight longer. Um, I don't know about the perspiration, though, of many layers of, of linen. Yeah, a linen shirt is definitely very nice to wear. We, we do a lot in my family, for example, in Sicily, my dad likes linen shirts a lot. Uh, but then again, I, I'm not sure about the perspiration qualities of linen when it's like 16 layers. Okay, exactly. So thank you, Metatron. Again, it gets hot. Okay, and speaking from experience, it gets hot. I was hotter wearing the tube and yoke than I was in the muscle cuirass. And one of the guys that suffered from heat stroke, the only guy that suffered from heat stroke, was in a layered linen cuirass.
or laid linen, linen thorax? Um, it's cheaper. You don't need a blacksmith who's a specialist to make it. I agree with him. That is very valid, which is probably one of the reasons why we see many of these citizen militias using the Tupin yoke. The aristocrats were the ones that were buying the cuirasses because they were more expensive, uh, but also likely a better armor. Again, as demonstrated through the um, artistic record and through practical testing. Uh, I'm going to call the video here for now just because I think I've managed to get the point across. Um, I'll leave a link to Metatron's video down below so you can watch the whole thing. I'll also leave a link below to um, a video where we, me and uh, Tilkaz will completely cover the tube and yoke and the thorax sort of evolution, all the different theories, far more in depth than I have in this video. And I'll also leave a link in the description to the um, video where we test the bronze grass. I'd also just like to say that our on-site documentary, Go Tell the Spartans, is out now. We'd very much appreciate it if you gave it a watch. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, and again, hopefully this didn't come across as, as an attack on Metatron or even the uh, or uh, Dr. Aldrede. Um, it was just adding another opinion, which I think that they sort of, uh, or that, that the Doctor missed out on. Um, so thank you very much for watching, and I'll hopefully see you in the next one.